Any baseball fans here? Yeah. How about any Giants fans here? Yeah. Well, I'm a huge Giants fan. What an incredible run they've had. How about any VC fans here? <laughs> well, I'm a VC fan at least some of the time. Do you know what baseball hitters and VCs have in common? Full body out. Yeah, a 30% success rate is considered good. So what I'm hoping today is what I'm talking about is in that 30%. A few other questions before we get started. How many of you have performed in an athletic competition and realized you hadn't trained well enough? <laughs> How many, how many of you have gone on a job interview and realized you didn't prepare well enough? And how many of you have taken a test and realized you didn't study enough? Well, I've done all three and it's not fun. So today we're going to talk about the risks of doing something before you're ready, especially with respect to product and market. So I'm Sean Jacobson. And I've been in the business cloud space for 15 years, and 13 years of it were in operating roles where I ran biz dev and or sales at four companies, Cornerstone On Demand, Wageworks, Elance, and Hightail. And um, most recently, I was at Emergence Capital and joined Norwest a few weeks ago. So uh, now I'm going to have uh, the panelists introduce themselves. So I'm... I'm Justin Moore, and I am the founder and CEO of Axiant. Uh, Axiant is a powerfully simple business recovery cloud that uh, enables a company to keep its core systems and applications up and running at all times. Um, I've started two uh, companies. One, a third one, sort of, uh, was never really successful. And uh, I also have a big VC, sometimes I'm a venture partner at Thomas Ventures as well. How you guys doing? Oh, awesome. that's good. I came in here from Toronto today. You're going to hear some oots and oots. Um, so yeah, I'm Mark Oregon, uh, founder and CEO of Influitive. Influitive helps you mobilize your army of customer advocates to generate a lot more. Referral leads, reference calls, case studies, videos, testimonials, social media buzz, all that kind of stuff you need to grow your company efficiently. Um, before that, I was uh, founder and CEO of Eloqua. Eloqua uh, was a marketing automation uh, pioneer, uh, founded in 2000, um, and uh, eventually went public um, and got sold to Oracle Corporation for about a billion dollars in uh, last year. Um, so, excited to tell you my story today, and let's get cracking. Great. Let's rock. Uh, very lucky to have both of them here. Uh, I actually uh, asked them both if they were interested. I thought one of them would say no, but they both said yes. So we're lucky we have to hear uh, stories from both guys. So um, we're going to make this interactive. Uh, I wrote an article on product market fit a couple months ago. It venture, it's in VentureBeat if you want to take a look at it. But I wrote it because there's a tremendous amount of confusion in this industry about how to define product market fit. Um, a lot of people think they've achieved it and spend a lot of money in sales and marketing before they're ready. I can think of one company, for example, that raised money at a hundred million valuation, raised $10 million. They thought they had achieved product market fit, spent all the money in a year on sales and marketing and were out of business within a year. And there's a lot of examples of that. And so I wanted to put a framework together that might be able to align people around how to define product market fit. Um, and it's really designed mostly for SaaS companies, which is what my experience has been in, but you probably can learn a lot for other business models as well. So if everyone can take out a piece of paper and a pen, and I'd like everyone to score along, uh, add up all your scores in each of these five areas, and then total them up, and we'll tell you what that means for your business and some recommendations we have. And while we're going through each of these points, Justin and Mark will give you some sense of how they scored their company at the time that they raised their first venture round. 
I found that when people fill these fill this out on their own, without a discussion like this, they give themselves the highest possible rating. <laughs> of course, you know if you're if you're the teacher and the student, you'll give yourself an A plus every time. But that's not necessarily going to be helpful for your business. Um, and then we'll have some time for questions afterwards. So the first point is around diversity of customers. And the key point here is companies that you did not know before you started your firm. So uh, it, this kind of reminds me of when I lived in LA. I moved to LA for Cornerstone On Demand. And the tech industry is big here. There it's all about the entertainment industry. And so people would, would create a movie, and they, they'd get all their friends to come see the movie premiere, and be standing room only, and they're like, wow, this movie is going to kill it. All my friends and family came to the movie, this is going to kill it across the world. And a lot of those movies never make it outside of LA. So it's the same kind of thing here. There's a lot of, a lot of startups that have customers that are their friends, and and they all try to raise money off of getting their friends as customers, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to work outside of Silicon Valley. The way my rule of thumb is, if it works in Des Moines, it probably works in Silicon Valley. But if it works in Silicon Valley, it probably doesn't work in Des Moines. So, Justin, how did you uh, rate your company at the time you raised venture funding? Uh, first, can everyone hear me in the back without the microphone? You can use this. Now. Yes. Good. Okay. Um, I was a five uh, on this when we raised our first venture round, and largely because I didn't know that many people um, in the Valley. I started the company seven years ago, so I was kind of mid-20s. Um, took longer than four years to not complete Stanford, because um, I left and started the company and went back. Um, and most of our customers were kind of small to medium-sized businesses. so. We had about 100, 120 customers. They were a variety of law firms and accounting firms and health professionals and other things. And acquired most of them, frankly, by calling them, cold calling them and getting references from one customer to another customer and attending uh, kind of local events. Um, so yeah, we, none of them were in our network. Well, that's a benefit of being young and not having a big network. Yeah, there, there was no network There, there were members. no friends to call. There was no friends to call. Yeah. Let's try the mic again. Okay, maybe I'll hold it down here. Um, so I'm going to tell you both about Eloqua and Fluida. Now, Eloqua is an interesting story because it was a uh, bootstrapped company. Um, we uh, ran a company uh, cash flow positive for three and a half years um, before we raised venture money. A lot of that was because we were not able to raise venture money. <laughs> a bunch of 20-somethings. Uh, um, Bunch of 20-somethings um, who really didn't know all, all that much. Um, so by the time we raised our first venture round at, at Eloqua, we already had a run rate of uh, something like 300000 a month, three or $400,000 a month. Um, and so I would rate us a five at that point. We had a natural advantage becoming from Toronto. They're, well, Silicon Valley was a foreign place. So uh, we're kind of forced to be kind of born global, and I think that was an advantage there. Um, now, interestingly, I'd say at Influitive, uh, I'd rate about a two um, on this, and that this is the advantage to being a serial entrepreneur. So, uh, for those of you that are working really hard to build your first company, there is a light at the end of the tunnel. If you are halfway successful this time, then you essentially can make up for the gap with a little bit of team experience. So, uh, I only had maybe 11 customers um, when we raised our Series A. About four of them were pilots, free pilots, um, you know, and the other ones were paying us not a lot. So it was maybe like 10k MRR when we raised our Series A at at Influid. <coughs> Again, special case though, you get you get extra points if you've done it before. Yeah, great. Well, thanks guys. So hopefully you guys are all scoring along. And the next one is around engagement. I think products like salesforce.com uh, are ones that score high in engagement from the beginning. Because salespeople spend three, four, five hours a day in the product, and if you pulled it out of their hands, it would, be, it would cause major disruption in their business. 
So just. Oh, uh, yeah. a one. Probably still a one, actually. Um, yeah, so our product is such that users don't typically log into our product and platform. Uh, it's it's uh, one of those things that is designed to ensure that businesses uh, don't have loss of productivity or interruption to their applications when primaries go down. So in an ideal world, you'd never use our product, but when you have to, it's business saving uh, or massive productivity and cost saving. So by design, our product is one that uh, people don't log into, and it has lots of automation and intelligence built in, so it kind of works on its own. Um, so uh, we were one then, and we're still one. Uh, well, some some business applications, uh, obviously, are, are more like Salesforce. It, I would say in this case, imagine if you pulled it away from your customers. How disruptive would that be for their business? And if it would be really disruptive, then it would probably be a five. It would be highly disruptive. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it How about was. at the time, even at the time you raised venture funding? Yeah, because businesses basically, the, our first customers were betting on us to protect their business over their incumbent solutions. So we were a very critical part of their IT infrastructure where if they didn't have us, they would absolutely have to replace us right away with something else or they would violate compliance, uh, they would be unprotected, uh, their business would be at risk. So yeah, from that perspective, it was always a five. Okay. It was mission critical day one. And I give you a five. Okay, I get a five then. I was like, I'm nervous about this one, man. I'm still a one. Yeah. No, good. So I think this is a great survey, and the reason why is, is for the first time, I think someone has defined product market fit as a continuum as opposed to a discrete endpoint, right? Mark Andreessen says product market fit is when the product flies off the shelf. Well, that's kind of hard to define. So I think that's great to have it in terms of a continuum. I, however, I think this question is the most, this one's the most questionable in terms of how well it actually ties a product market fit. I think you've just defined it better. It's not about how often they log in. It's about how mission critical it is to the success of the company. Um, so I'd say both at, at Eloqua and Influitive, uh, they're both category creators. We're trying to create, uh, in, in Fluidive's case, we're trying to create a market around advocate marketing, trying to build that demand. Um, did the same thing at Eloqua around automating demand gen. So, we were lower on both of these. I would say that um, Eloqua, when we raised our Series A in 2005, which is five years in, we were a three. Um, eventually it became a five. There are a number of companies where Eloqua was absolutely mission critical and they could not live without it, but it, it took a while for the market to build to that point. Um, I would say that at Influitive, we're about a one or two on that. Um, and that's because we're still very much building a vision behind this market. I do think within five years we'll be a five. Great. Third point around churn. So I, I commonly hear companies say, hey, you know, I only have 4% a month churn. That's pretty good, right? <laughs> that's amazing how often I hear it. Seriously? Yes, I do hear it all the time. Uh, but then I said, well, that means that 50% of your customers are leaving Works every year. <laughs> so in the early days, you can continue to grow. But imagine once you get to 10 million in revenue, and if you're losing 50% of your customers every year, or 50% 50 of your revenue every year, just to just to do 10 million again, you got to sell 5 million that year. So it's, it, eventually, you'll have no way of growing. So um, a company that I worked at, uh, before Cornerstone on Demand, who started selling at the enterprise, have done really well with this. They uh, only have 5% annual churn, and that is that include that that doesn't include any upsells. So I know a lot, a lot of companies can mask churn by saying, "Well, it's really we don't have any churn when you factor an upsell and yeah, when you factor an upsell and expansion." The challenge is that at some point in time you won't be able to continue to upsell or increase price. And it doesn't really demonstrate the health of your business. So, you know, gross churn is really the number to use uh, in, in this metric. Yeah, it's funny you say that. We don't even measure net churn. I mean, we measure it, but it doesn't show up on our, like, board summary financial packets because of what you just said. If your gross churn is controlled enough that you have, you know, in leading class, then you should have really good net churn, but you can mask churn problems with net churn. This is an interesting one. So this is one we actually struggled with quite a bit at Axiant in the, in the mid days, I would say. 
in the early days, we always measured churn. We were always aware when customers canceled. One of our values, you know, central values is customer first. So we were always very focused on making sure our customers are happy. And part of the way we measured that was whether our customers renewed. But, so, you know, from that perspective, using this strict definition, I'd probably give us a two or three in the early days. Um, what I would say we missed, though, was the importance of looking at churn trends. Because as you said in the early days, you could have low churn on, uh, or seemingly low churn, but as that number gets bigger and bigger, unless your net new revenue uh, far outpaces your churn rate, it starts to become a big problem. And when we were about 10, 15 million in revenue, um, we hit 30% churn. And it is really tough to keep your business growing. You know, we were still growing, you know, triple digits, percentages, fairly high triple digit percentages. But it's very hard to keep your business growing when you're losing 30% of your customer base, especially when you have thousands of customers under your belt. And this is one where we were definitely not on top of as much as we should have been. Um, looking at the leading indicators, measuring churn on a weekly basis. We actually measure churn on a weekly basis now. Um, and we look at where are we against uh, a predictable linear curve within week for a quarter, the week against the quarter, and that quarter against where we expect to be uh, within a year. And if we see anything that's off, we do a, a deep dive immediately on what's going on. Is there anything that could be behind it? What's causing these churn issues? Is it product? Is it price? Within product, what is it specifically? And we often find that there is a systemic issue that we weren't aware of that we then need to go tackle before it becomes a, a massive churn problem. And when you're running a SaaS business, you know, when we hit that 30% churn, in that year, we lost about, um, I'd say probably about $20 million in customer lifetime value, um, which when you start putting in those perspectives is a huge number, as opposed to just looking at it as 2% a month or 2.5% a month, we started looking at what's the lifetime value of that churn. Um, and uh, it, it's a critical one. And now we're at you know just uh, about 14% churn, uh, which for a year, yeah. per year, which for an SMB focused company is considered best in class and above. Most are kind of 20, 25% per year, or kind of 14% per year. But it's because we had this obsessive focus, and we had the obsessive focus because we got absolutely punished because we didn't pay enough attention early on, and it became the entire obsession of the company. Yeah, uh, that, that's great. I think lots of insights there. Uh, of all the questions here, I think this is by far the most important. So hopefully, that's one of the things you'll take away from from, from this is that. I think the best predictor of product market fit is that your customers continue to renew with you. And I mean, I would add some to that, that actively advocate for you and help you get more customers, which I think is even a better, uh, a better metric than renewal. Right? We do uh, renew a lot of accounts because we have no real effective competition at Intuitive. Um, but only somebody who's super happy is gonna advocate for you. So I would say that, um, uh, you know, coming, I came out of Bain to build, uh, to build Eloqua, which had a real discipline around loyalty and around advocacy. So I was pretty obsessed with this coming into Eloqua. So uh, we were definitely five points, probably more, like, more than five points, I would say, at Eloqua when we raised our Series A. And, and even at Influitive, where a lot of my numbers are lower because we raised essentially a preemptive A round, an earlier A round, we were uh, pretty close to a five here too. Um, at uh, you know at Influitive and now uh, at our Series B we're actually at six percent uh, gross churn. Um, so yeah, we manage every dollar like our life depended on it. That said, these numbers include customers that we fire. So one of the ways, paradoxically, to keep your churn rate down is when you have problem accounts that probably should never have been sold in the first place. Um, that are dragging down the morale of your customer success team and preventing them from saving the accounts that are worth saving, you've got to let those guys go. And so my churn rates include the ones that we fired um, or the ones that we've lost to bankruptcy, which were a lot in the 2001 to 2004 timeframe when uh, building Eloqua. And the way that we fire customers is we just triple the price on them and then they decide not to pay anything. <laughs> You know, one, one interesting thing to add to this, because I do think, I agree, I think this is one of the most important ones. If you're thinking about a SaaS business or any kind of renewals business, one of the big learning lessons in our analysis, and I, I think you, know, you mentioned Cornerstone, so known for exceptionally low churn, 
Um, then you have a company like Workday, which has both hyper growth and extremely low churn, which is unheard of. There are very few companies that have that. And someone actually did an interesting analysis. If you look at kind of a 10 year horizon, if you compare kind of a cornerstone, which has solid growth, but not hyper growth and really low churn, and you compare hyper growth with you know, okay to good churn, long term, Cornerstone ends up being the better business model because as you grow your business in the out years, your base represents such an enormous part of your revenue yeah. that your net new cannot possibly compare to your base revenue. And if you are keeping that base, there's that much less you have to put in the top that's new every year. And so you end up building a better business that will actually have better revenue growth long term, even if the interim years, it was a lower growth. And so, you know, people have asked me, well, knowing that, which would you take? If you had to pick between one and the two, would you take you know solid growth, like 30% to 50% growth, and kind of really low churn, or would you rather have like 150% growth and like mid to high churn? And I'm 100%, I'll take lower growth, lower churn, because low growth, low churn, when you've built enough of an installed base and a customer base, will mean a much better company long term. Yeah, and, and, we're, and we're talking about gross churn here, but <clears throat> because Cornerstone has such low gross churn, they're able to tack on a lot of other products um, and also increase price. You know, typically every year they're, they've been increasing price 5 to 15%, and usually people don't say anything because they're happy about the product, and they've, they've been able to sell additional products on top of it. Um, so the net churn is just amazing. It's like 120%. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is, uh, you know, contract length and size of customer you're going after. So I'll give you an example in the early days. I know we look at Salesforce as a hugely successful company worth like $35 billion. But they almost went out of business in the early days. They signed month-to-month -month deals. And they had extraordinarily high churn. So more than 50% a year. And a uh, new guy came in running sales and basically told their sales reps, we'll double your commission if you sign annual deals. They never signed a month-to-month -month deal again after that. <laughs> so, you know, it's really how you pay people. Uh, and the, and the other, other way to think about it is uh, one reason there's a lot of churn with SMBs is the fact that they're SMBs and if you go after the real low end of the market, they're going to churn just because they go out of business or change priorities. So you got to be careful that you know um, you're not going after a market that's going to churn, irregardless of how well your product might be serving their needs. So here's the fourth of five around commitment level. So you know there's there certain you know certain very crowded spaces out there, um, and I probably won't mention some of them because maybe some of you guys are you know uh, in those spaces. But where I meet a bunch of entrepreneurs in those spaces, and they all have the same customer logos on their slides. <laughs> and, and then I call the company, and I say, so, um, I see you're, you know, you're using 12 products. And they're like, yeah, you know, we're testing them out, and next year we'll decide which one we're going to commit to. So they're all trying to raise funding on the idea that they have a customer, but none of them are getting much money, and no one's got a longer-term commitment. So, you know, as, a, as an investor, I want to try to figure out who is the winner in the space, and that doesn't really help. So, um, <clears throat> my rule of thumb, even in the earliest days, if you're going after a Fortune 500 company, they should be paying you at least six figures a year. Like, I have one, one company came to me recently and said, we have GE as a customer. And I'm like, well, so how much are they paying? Well, they have two employees using it, they're paying us $5,000. <laughs> that doesn't really, you shouldn't have earned the right to put GE's logo on your customer page. So if, so if you're going after Fortune 500, it's gotta be at least 100K a year, even in the earliest days, that, because that's really not that much money for them, if they're really committed to your product. Going after a mid-market customer, it should be five figures annually, and if you're going after an SMB customer, at least four figures annually. If it's not a meaningful check size for the customer, then they're not really that committed to your product. Um, I was laughing when you said people putting logos on slides because I've had probably five VCs call me in the past six to nine months going, hey, you heard your customer of XYZ company, how are you liking their product? And I'm like, 
we are? And go, I don't know, I'll get back to you. And I go to the CFO, hey, are, are we paying for some product called XYZ? Nope, nope. Send it to support. Finally, I find out there's like one individual in the company in support who like signed up for a free trial. And I'm like, yeah, we're not really using the product, so. <laughs> but anyway, um, on, on this one, interesting. Um, so add some color to what you said earlier, and then I'll share some of our experiences. So you mentioned Salesforce, and one of the things you mentioned was the annual contracts. But there's something along uh, that goes along with that that you were kind of referring to when you were talking about size of customer, which was Salesforce's early customers were also very small. Yes. And if you look at how they've marched up the revenue over time, what you see is that in, in most successful SaaS companies, they tend to march the monthly recurring revenue or annual recurring revenue or ACV, whatever you use as your measurement, up over time because the cost of sale relative to the revenue, relative to the churn. And it's those three things. Salesforce, NetSuite, HubSpot. I mean, you can literally go through all the companies. You look at their early customers, then you look at their customers when they go public, and then you look at the customers kind of three, five years after they've gone public. They all march up the MRR. They all march to the size of customer. The churn goes down. Why? I mean, NetSuite, as an example, had over 30% churn in the early days. I think it was almost 40%, but it was really high. Huge churn, but their average customer size was a thousand bucks a year. So, you know, when you're selling to a small customer, you're gonna have huge business mortality, um, uh, tend to be more price sensitive, it tends to be less embedded because it's a smaller install, therefore it's easier to replace. And now NetSuite's average customer is 80 grand a year. Trust professional services, that's just in their services. Um, uh, and so we found the same thing. So our average customer when we started the company was about $1,000 a year. Now, our customers, I'd say we were probably at three or four. And again, slightly different because we waited to raise funding just like you did with Eloqua until we were doing, you know, we weren't at your MRR levels, but you know, we were in the three, four hundred thousand or five hundred thousand dollars a year before we raised any venture funding or any uh, any capital. Um, so we kind of built it ourselves and, and and kind of funded it ourselves, and so we had to get customers. And we were typically signing either month to month or annual. There's not a lot of benefit to us getting pilots because our goal wasn't to go raise a round. Our goal was to first build a company. And then at some point we realized that if we got outside funding, we could grow the company more quickly. But our goal was always to build a company and therefore we had to have revenue. So we charged for it. So I'd say we were about a three. But one of the things we've, we've become keenly aware of is our average customer size then was $1,000 a year. Our average customer size today is, is about $6,000 a year. The churn is still higher than we like and the cost of customer acquisition is higher than we like. So we now have a new mandate internally, which is our average customer target is 25, is 20 plus thousand dollars a year. We are trying to focus more on mid-market and get to 20 to 30 thousand dollar a year customers. That focus really started this year and we've signed customers that are as much as a quarter million dollars a year, even half a million dollars a year now. And what we're finding is that the cost of customer acquisition is not that much more. It's more, but it's not close to as much as the four or five X we're seeing in terms of average deal size, the churn is inherently lower. The stickiness is higher because they're embedding our platform as part of a huge part of their IT environment and it's harder to replace it. So we have certainly learned that lesson on our own and then gone back and done the research on every other SaaS company gone, oh, okay, it's the same thing everyone else figured out already. Um, but we learned it the hard way. And so I'd say we were probably a three and we are actually looking at, um, we still, we have annual contracts only, but people can pay month to month. We're actually looking at doing only annual pay um, as one change from a cash management perspective. And we are actually trying to incentivize both our channel and our uh, reps to sign three plus year contracts. And we have a rule now, whenever ever there's meaningful discounting over 20%, it must be a three plus year contract. Because then we can look at the, the 20%, we can look at what it should theoretically do to our churn and we can justify that discount if we know that we'll keep the customer for sure for three years. And what's interesting about what Justin is doing, they started with very small businesses and they've moved their way up. I found about 80% of SaaS companies start small and move their way up. Uh, the only way you can't move your way up is if there's already a credible upmarket player that blocks you. Yeah, Mark. No, I, that's great. Um, so yeah, so at, at Eloqua, um, the first customer that we ever won, we started at $3,000 a month. Uh, I don't know why I picked such a high number, but it was, I mean, that turned up being fortuitous. 
Um, after that first customer, um, we, we want to try to win more customers. We actually needed to lower our price in order to win um, some other customers that we were talking to. Um, and uh, that was taking us nowhere fast. So to your point, you know, we, we saw our cash pile start to dwindle. It became very clear that we weren't going to raise any money. So I was lucky that I had a great mentor who basically taught me exactly what you just said, which is, okay, if you want to be a cash flow positive, self-sustaining company and not require any venture capital in your business, here's what you should do. You should triple your prices. You should charge for everything, including your prospect's own needs analysis, which we did. Um, you, want, you want to build it, you want to see a demo of the product? You've got to pay for a demo environment. I'm not kidding. Um, and do hyper, hyper focus on a niche so that we became so knowledgeable about a couple of key areas of software that we sold into that prospects were willing to pay for our expertise. And we got the company profitable actually pretty quick um, and stayed profitable for three and a half years. So again, that's a bootstrapped, kind of bootstrapped environment. Um, so at Influitive, I said, hey, let's, there's all so this. How did you score yourself? Oh, at the time so of I have five for sure. I mean, yeah. all of our, all of our deals were at least a year. I, I don't think that highly of a three-year deal because frankly, I mean, again, I've lived through a tough time, 2001 and 2004. A lot of people stop paying their bills. So they can sign up with a three-year deal. If they're not gonna pay you three years up front, I don't think it counts. Um, because, you know, a, a contract, um, I mean, what are you gonna do, sick? You gonna sick a collections agency after these people? I, you know, that doesn't really work that well. It just gives you a bad, reputation in, in the industry. Um, so I, I don't really think that highly necessarily of a three-year contract unless they pay up front or unless it's a three-year deal with an annual component that's paid up front. I really like those deals, those are great. Um, but at, at Influitive, we want to try something different. And like uh, freemium was all the rage and, and my fellow national compatriots at Hootsuite was building an enormous business on freemium. We're like, let's go try that, right? That's, that's a great way to build a, a fast business. and. What we learned was that, um, yes, we had a bunch of free trials, but the customers weren't that committed. Um, and so what we did is we figured out what the price was so that the customer would actually be committed and not put an intern on the product, but put a director level person on it. And it turns out that price was approximately $8,000 for three months. Um, so our goal was to get as many committed logos as, as possible. Um, I, I think there's a continuum with, when, you, when you're building a company now, you know, free pilot to paid pilot to 12-month contract to three-month out to 12-month contract with no out to 12-month contract all paid up front. Um, and I think as you march closer to that 12 months all paid up front, you're getting closer and closer to, you know, product market fit. Um, so I'd say at Influitive, again, in a sense, we substituted team experience for some of that product market fit. The, our Series A investors made a bet that me and my team would be able to close the gap. So we would only have been maybe a three, or uh, three and a half out of five when we raised that influence. Okay, great. And so the final point is around word of mouth and virality. So uh, in one of my favorite companies here in the early days, uh, an emergence capital company, Civitas Learning. So they sell software to higher education. And they they found a product that was really mission critical, and and since that community talks to each other quite a bit, before they even talk to a prospective customer, those prospective customers had already talked to at least three of their customers. So that's that's what can happen when you're focused on an industry where people share with their friends the industry standard solution they're using. And, it, and that word of mouth can really spread, and then uh, then you earn the right to sell more and more products to them on top of it. Uh, uh, we were definitely uh, one. Um, we it was all outbound, cold calling, networking, um, trying to get referrals from people we knew. I mean, it was just hard trench warfare for every single customer in the early days. Again, I go back to, you know, didn't have a network, had no, no money, um, and so we couldn't really afford uh, a ton of online marketing. I mean, we literally would 
look at a role, you know, we got a lawyer uh, as a customer, and then we figured out, okay, well, where's a database of 100 <laughs> lawyers in the area? And then we would call them and say, you know, uh, who deals with uh, this issue in your business, protecting your data? Great. Well, we're working with companies like, you know, XYZ, who's our only legal customer in the area. Um, you know, and we built our business that way. So it was one, there was no viral marketing, there was no inbounds um, at all. Yeah, and this is one, again, I don't think the correlation is as strong between this question of product market fit. Um, if you're a category creator, you're gonna do, you're gonna, you gotta do some outbound and CEO networking is gonna, is gonna happen. You, you, you know, honestly, is any company gonna really buy your solution just because they like you and go for a beer? I, I don't think that happens anymore, I don't know. Um, I, I, I still think that a company is gonna acquire a product if they really believe in it, not because of a relationship with, with CEO or whatnot. But, so I, I would say that um, Eloqua was three points on this where uh, there was customer referrals but there was an awful lot of outbound going on um, and, and having to build build up that uh, that brand of ours um, and I'd say Influitive also only because we committed to inbound marketing um, much earlier in our life and, and wanted to make that we really wanted to make the whole like inbound freemium thing work uh, because Eloqua was such a like heavy lifting outside Salesforce, big outbound lead gen effort. I wanted to try to build a more lightweight model. Um, so I would say we're three here for Influitive as, as well. I think you make a point which is true. Which is, it, one of the ways to look at this question, it, it really depends on your market. So if you're conducive to like line of business, individual sale, you know, you're probably gonna get more, and, and it's something people are actively looking for, you'll probably get more virality, and then this question right. probably works better. Um, I think when you're category creating or uh, kind of take a new market, another way to look at it is how many people are actually looking for a solution if you're, right? And, and they may be looking for it in a traditional way and can you exactly. hijack that research that people are doing and have you figured out how to start being part of the conversation early on? And we were very unsavvy when we started this company about all these things. So, you know, we didn't know about how to be part of the conversation and frankly, it, even in six years, it's become much easier to be part of the conversation with LinkedIn, with a whole variety of yeah, other things. You gotta rewrite this question, it's wrong. I would, I would <laughs> sorry, it's wrong. I would look more at, at cycle times, right? When you send a cold email, how long, do, you know, how many people click through on that? How long is your cycle between the initial, um, initial conversation between uh, like an SDR or a, an AE and a prospect? How fast do you move that to second meeting? How fast do we go and get a contract? Once we get the contract done, how fast do we get them up to speed? Uh, how fast do we get paid, right? So when I was at Eloqua, again, we were bootstrapped, I was maniacally obsessed with these cycle times because literally our life depended on it, right? If we didn't do those, so we were always looking for where the bottleneck is, get the whole company focused on those things. So that's what I would look at it and say, how long is your sales cycle? How long is your um, time to value? So Eloqua, we looked at time to measurable value. How do we shorten that? How do you get it so that you can launch the customer in two weeks instead of a month, and then a week instead of two weeks, and then how do you launch them in hours? Um, and that, to me, is actually correlated to product market fit, I think, more than this stuff. This is my opinion. Yeah, I think it, it also probably depends if you are creating a category or not. Yeah. Yeah. So really, if you're creating a category, it's impossible to start at a five, because it's possible you may have created a category where there's not enough demand. Um, if you have created, if you are joining an already existing category, you might have a much better product, and now you can just displace the market. Right. And yeah. you know, so yeah, there's a lot of ways to measure this. And um, but but anyway, so how did you guys? It's not, it's not totally wrong. Yeah, I was like, the, 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 the intent of the question though is an important one. Which yeah, yeah, yeah. Is, you, In one of your earlier questions, it was really about once someone's deployed this and they are using it would taking it away from them <laughs> negatively impact their business? And another way to look at that, on the, that's, so that's once you are in the business, another way to look at that is on the front end, as they are looking at making a purchasing decision, is there enough pain 
around are you solving enough pain that they're actively interested in using your solution in one of two ways. Solving a pain, moving a negative, or solving a pain in terms of an efficiency where they can gain better productivity. And if you, there are different ways to measure that, but it's super important to measure that because if you're you know, trying to convince people that they need what you have, that's a much harder market to crack than people have either identified a pain where like, God, this hurts, I didn't want to remove this, or gee, I'd like to grow faster, right? Which is kind of the, positive, the flip side. I think it's always better to be in the productivity curve, and we're sort of, but not really. Um, is can you help people grow their business faster? And people are always looking for ways to get an edge over their competitors. If you fit into one of those two categories and you can measure it through email responsiveness or SDRs or people looking for more traditional solutions that solve that pain, it's super, super important because I can't tell you how many companies I've looked at, um, CEOs I've advised where I'm like, I just don't think people have enough pain around the solution to really have a company. Like you're gonna convince people they need what you have when they don't think they need it. That's hard, that's really yeah. hard. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, So hopefully everyone scored along the way here. So how many of you scored zero to nine points? Thanks for being honest. <laughs> about 10 to 17? That's one of my companies, 10 to 17. And 18 to 25? The other one. And, and how did you how did you guys score when you first raised your venture rounds? Again? Yeah, so so um, uh, Eloqua was a twenty three, and Influitive was a fifty. I think I was somewhere around eighteen, nineteen. Um, I've spotted a couple, and then you're generous on one where I rated myself a one and gave me a five. So yeah. I, I suppose I get so up I, to like nineteen. I pushed you to the next category. Yeah, exactly. I would have been ten to seventeen otherwise. Yeah. But I guess I'm like nine. So, so, you know, here is some uh, of my thoughts around go-to-market. Um, certainly when you're in the zero to nine category, the founder should be the head of sales. You shouldn't be out there trying to find someone. You're still trying to figure out if you have product market fit. And the early customers are going to want to know that you're committed to, your, committed to their business success. And you have the sense for the problem you're trying to solve more than anyone else. Salespeople are coin operated, and if they don't have some reference accounts to, to leverage, uh, they're going to leave pretty quickly. So you know, once you're starting to see that you may be in product market fit mode, um, you know, in the 10 to 17 category, it might be worth hiring a couple sales reps. And I say two sales reps because. If both perform really well, then probably you're onto something, and maybe it's time to hire two or hire more. If one is performing well and one's not, then it's probably performance related. If they're both not performing well, then you probably aren't a product market fit yet, and you might need to retrench. You guys have any thoughts around? Uh, I add one <clears throat> clarification to this as you're thinking about this. So I could read this and go. You know, hey, I'm a 20, 21. It's time to invest in go to market to accelerate. I'm gonna go hire 10 salespeople and blow out of the water. And I've seen a lot of companies do that, and I've done that. And then I had to riff half the sales force, um, which was awful. So one caveat on this, which is there is a big difference between product market fit and I have figured out a repeatable sales model and go to market strategy. Because one, the, the CEO and founder can be a phenomenal salesperson. And two, you can find those early people, those early types of salespeople who are just awesome startup salespeople. They're scrappy, they're undisciplined, they're, they're not metrics oriented, they don't spend their time in Salesforce. They just figure out how to get it done in a different way for every deal. And if you scored yourself like a 21 and you had two people like that, which again, we actually, I'm repeating like history from my own life experience. So then we went, we're like, okay, we got a venture round, now we got three people. We're great on all this stuff. And so we hired like 10 sales reps and we went up to like 13 people. And all of a sudden, you know, we we're doing kind of double the amount of new monthly recurring revenue with five times the sales force. So our sales efficiency just like fell off a cliff for six months. And, you know, we were at the board, we we're like, this is not working. So we basically had to riff more than half the sales people and retrench and now focus on look, we've got product market fit, people like it, but our sales model does not scale. We need to reassess the scalable sales model 
And that was a big learning lesson for me because I've been very disciplined since then about looking at each step of the way as I incrementally hire more salespeople, are we maintaining that scalability? And as soon as we have those checkpoints, we hire more and hire more and hire more. But that was an expensive, expensive learning lesson, probably a million dollar learning lesson when you thought, think about the impact of churn on morale, I mean riffs on morale, and the hiring and firing and retraining and all this kind of stuff. Um, and I've seen tons of companies make that mistake. So that's my caveat to this slide. Yeah, I agree. You need, you need to have a repeatable sales model that then you can leverage for the next set of salespeople. I, I, I do see that problem. A lot of times you don't even know what the right profile of sales rep you want to hire. So you need to get the early successes before you know what profile you need. Yeah, I got a similar story on that. Um, so way before my, my Series A at Eloqua, I did raise a seed, seed round. And I got real excited. And I did go and hire uh, three journeyman type reps. So those are reps that are not the cowboys. They're not artists. They are actually the types that you should hire later that know how to follow a process. That's actually not what you want to hire early days. You do want, frankly, artists who uh, have no problem lying through their teeth, actually, uh, in the very early days. But one thing I was really, really lucky is that one of my angel investors happened to be a sales trainer in his past life. And so what he counseled, he came in to see what was going on. And he counseled right away and says, you fire these people now. He put me through his sales training program, taught me how to sell. Uh, and said, you're going to get out there and you're going to go and close deals yourself. And frankly, God, you know, that guy's amazing. He saved my company, right? Because that from that point on, I was going out there. I'm certainly not the best salesman in the world, but um, I was able to really listen and learn and figure out what it took to get our product sold. Um, then I hired more entrepreneurial types kind of like me. Um, and those people actually did quite well. Uh, for a while, and then eventually we got to the point where we did bring in a VP of sales, probably too late. I probably waited a year too late to bring in a VP of sales. That guy had to fire all my sales reps and then hire journeymen who could follow a process. Uh, J yeah, Jason Lepkin has some great blog posts, by the way, on this. And also, I've had, a, I've had an interview, if you do, do a search on my name for Mark and you know Cowboy Sales Rep or something like that, you'll find a really good interview where I talk about <coughs> how to actually build a sales force in the beginning and then the middle and then the end. But yeah, very painful lessons, I think, for both of us on this one. And then probably every entrepreneur. Right? Yeah. And then you were head of sales at Influted for a pretty long time. Yeah, for a long time. Like, for, like how far did you get into revenue? Oh, uh, so, so, so two, I mean, two years in. And then I, I only hired one rep, and then I didn't hire two, I hired one. But I worked, essentially, I was the other rep. It was me and the other rep, so it was kind of a pair. Mm -hmm. Um, and it was us two for two years. And, and that's not just for sales, it's because that's, um, and this other person is very entrepreneurial, in fact he just left my company to start his own company. That, that is the mark of a great rep number one, or number two, is they're actually entrepreneurial and they won't be with you forever. But the two of us were going often as, you know, as a pair and learning from one another and this sort of thing. And so you're not just being a sales, like a sales rep number one is not just a salesperson, they're also almost a mini product manager, right? They're listening for trends, and they're looking, they're trying, they're A-B testing different messages, and they're seeing what works, right? They're feeding all that back into the engineering team. Um, and, it, and it really wasn't until, as soon as we, we got one, one our 10th customer, that's when we started to say, okay, we hired um, sales rep number two, and then three and four, in very rapid succession. As Chad had indicated uh, earlier, this is actually a continuation of an event that we had, I think, a couple months ago with actually a, a couple of participants that uh, met the bar and we invited back, no, just kidding, uh, that uh, participated last time as well, Maria and Neil. Um, so we should go ahead and uh, introduce ourselves. The topic, again, is slightly different than the initial conversation, but this is around scaling. The last conversation we had a couple months ago was around business development generally, and I think there was a discussion or a request to really focus on scaling the business development function within your company. So let's go ahead and just introduce ourselves, Maria. Testing? Great. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for sticking around and for your patience. Uh, I'm Maria Karaivanova. I'm currently head of business development and part in partnerships at Cloudflare. At Cloudflare, uh, we are on a mission to build a better internet, uh, and we provide performance and security services to um, anyone with a website. Uh, prior to joining Cloudflare three years ago, I was a venture capitalist at Gito Capital. 
And uh, prior to that, have done various roles, including business development at uh, very large organizations and uh, some small organizations. So it's, uh, it's great to be back. Thank you. Thanks, Rachel. Great. Great. Well, hi, I'm Michael Fisher. Um, I manage uh, international business development uh, with a particular focus on mobile and uh, platform work uh, at Twitter. Um, before that, I spent uh, some time at Shazam, managing uh, his VP of business development at Shazam. Before that, a number of years at Google, um, and also was uh, uh, an early guy at Virgin Mobile, started the business back in 2001. Um, my name is Neil Wall. I lead business development at Box. I've uh, been there a couple of years. Before that, I uh, built and ran BD for Symantec and did a few different things, small company and some large companies before that. So, David, David Pollack, uh, head of uh, US partnerships at Xero for online accounting software. Uh, about eight years, uh, can you hear me? No, no. Uh, we're about eight years old, have about 370,000 small business customers globally, and uh, partnerships at Zero are everything from our large financial institutions to our 300 add-on partners that do really vertical online of business applications. So before Zero, I was uh, moved around a bit, but spent some time at some time at Amex doing business development there, uh, and before that, marketing analytics at City. Um, so financial services, and then. Uh, some, some form of BD for about 10 years before that as well. So um, we are going to try to cover a couple of topics, and then within each topic, maybe we'll pause for a few questions, OK? So this will be interactive. Um, we had started a conversation on email around topics to cover, and then David had the wise uh, question of, well, why don't we define business development? So let's go go ahead. David, do you want to take a stab at that? I, I don't think I've ever heard business development find the same way twice. <laughs> so I feel like if we're going to talk about this, we should all kind of understand how many Good idea. points of view. Mic up a little bit closer. Yep, sorry. I've never heard business development defined twice, the same way twice. So uh, I define it as uh, it's the, the business development function is finding new value for the company um, in ways that you traditionally would not extract value, and it's doing it through partnerships. Um, I've also seen it defined many different ways at Box. It's quite simple. Uh, net new revenue streams that for scale. So companies like AT&T selling box to their business customers, or building a platform of other companies that can actually accelerate your ecosystem. So uh, some companies maybe in this room are actually using box as the back end to power their mobile or their future SaaS applications that have content need. And so BD is uh, the engine that actually promotes negotiates and promotes the use of Box to in other applications. Um, we do a few other things, but that's a good definition. Yeah, I agree. It's, it's difficult to define. I think it's super dependent on the company and the circumstances. Um, I guess the way I've always thought about it is that it's, uh, uh, it, it's business development drives the KPIs of the business, but it's not revenue, so it's not sales. Um, it's anything else uh, that the company does. It's not sales. It basically works uh, with, with with partners and third parties to drive uh, the KPIs of the business. Um, that's my whack at it. At uh, Cloudflare, I categorize it in three different categories. Uh, the first one is tr strategic partnerships. So th those are large strategic partners, Sumos or Goliaths or however you want to categorize them, that actually move the needle. Um, and that includes international expansion as well. The second category is channel and distribution, and that includes um, reseller programs, um, referral programs, and so forth. And the third category are deep technology integrations. Um, we have a very technical product, so integrations at the platform level um, at variety of layers of the internet infrastructure that makes sense for our company. Okay, great. Well, I think that's helpful to kind of set the context uh, so Michael, uh, Twitter's public. Um, it is a, a great service. I love it. I've loved it ever since it came out. Um, Takes back to the very, very beginning, maybe from your perspective. Uh, how did you guys? What are the basics for scaling the business development function that you guys kind of embraced? There, is there anything you can say about that? <laughs> no. Um, we. Uh, I think the biggest, the biggest challenge of Twitter has been to to put um, sort of a measurement against business development. I think that. Um, early on, uh, 
growth was so fast and, and activity was so strong and basically whatever we built for, for a US market just kind of took off around the world that there was really no need to kind of think uh, deeply about how to measure ourselves. And I think the key to, to our uh, kind of growing the business development function, um, the first thing was really about figuring out how to measure ourselves. Um, it's not always easy and it's not always crisp, um, but we try our best. Um, if we have to estimate, we estimate. But at the end of the day, at the end of every quarter, we have to make sure that we're being held to something, even if it's if it's forecasting activity one or two quarters down the road, which oftentimes business development is, is sort of focused on. So I would say the first thing is really measurement. I think the second thing is um, Twitter has evolved a significant amount in terms of how we approach the market and, and, and how we develop product around the world. Um, and business development has had to evolve with it. So there's been a very um, kind of steady introspective view on what Twitter, uh, excuse me, what business development is doing for the company. I think um, one of the successes we've had is kind of migrated the function from just deal making to deal making plus partner management to deal making plus partner management plus some sort of like technical account management, etc. cetera. Um, uh, the, the company has grown, there's been turnover, which is quite public. Um, and the business development function has had to be flexible, but all, all the while kind of recognizing the value that it's creating for the company and, and being comfortable with that changing over time. So as it stands today, we're actually quite, we, we serve a quite technical function, right? There's the product managers that work on Android every day and, and, and that are you know, thinking very deeply about how to localize you know, the experience for Japan or Korea or, or anywhere in the world. They really don't want to think about um, uh, you know the details of a partner integration, and so that's forced our team to get quite technical and to bring on technical resources that that in, in many companies would just be product managers or even engineers, but we 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 adopt them and bring them into business development. So um, so taking a close look at our own needs and, and how business development um, fills them, I think has been another critical uh, element to to how we scale. So I'd say being able to measure our, our, our contribution and also being flexible about what, what the value that we bring to the company over time. How about that? Other thoughts around basics for scaling the business development function? Anyone? Yeah. Brian? Go ahead. So up until recently, uh, the business development function was very much one person, um, a Cloudflare, which is quite typical at earlier stage companies. So the way I viewed it is, okay, great, I have very limited human resources. However, there's so many people on the team who, anyone from support to the developer team to sales, who can actually serve as business development resources through their networks and connections. So um, that was kind of early days, and piece of advice for those of you starting um, your own companies or in early stage companies, literally treat everyone as an extension of your business development organization, because people do talk to each other, people go to events, and uh, if you teach them right on what the needs are and what the strategic focus is, they will actually be part of your business development organization. Uh, having said that, now from a team perspective, and I think Michael covered nicely all the different uh, terms and matrix um, around measuring the success um, of the business development function, but from a team standpoint, uh, today um, we have two senior business development people who are going after those strategic partnerships and large deals. Then we have an account management fu function um, that, that works and manages large accounts, checks in regularly with them, works also very closely with our marketing and PR organization. Um, on top of that, there is product because we are also very technical. And um, I have a technical trainer on the team um, because it is very important when you have technical solution that those partners understand how to sell it and position it to their customers and are excited. So it, it really depends on what works best for your company when you're building the team around around business development. Yeah, I guess a um, like couple of thoughts that might sound odd, but scaling BD, I think is, I've experienced it in two ways. One, I run BD at Symantec, we bought Veritas, I inherited a BD team when I was running Symantec, it was maybe eight or nine people. 
or about $3 billion in revenue. And then I heard of this other team, which is another $3 billion in revenue, and it was an additional 75 people. And it was like, what do I do with all of these people? And so we downsized to what I thought was right, was about 20, 22 people net. And it, that was hard, but, um, and what was interesting is metrics are important, and, and at Box, Box has had explosive growth as a company since I joined. Um, but the BD team has actually been flat. And that's with intent because I'm more interested in being able to execute on the things the BD team are doing in engineering or in product or in sales than getting more people in BD. And so that's a constant balance that I would ask everybody to think about is, you know, BD is an important function and you, you need to make sure that you have a really focused team that are aligned to the strategy but make sure that the, the work to be done is actually being executed on. Um, my colleague who runs engineering at Box, we, we kid around and he says, you know, I, I need three engineers for every BD person to support the things that you guys bring in. And that's actually not precise, but that's a, it's a useful way to think about it. It's not scaling the BD team, it's scaling the functions to support the things you as a company want to go do. I hate to get too tactical, but for, uh, it depends really for me on the like stage of the business. Uh, so at zero, we're a relatively young company in the US, and it's a question of deal flow and capacity. And if the business starts to, is prioritizing deals that are falling away because there's just not enough capacity to manage them, you need to expand BD. Um, as a business matures, so uh, Amex was the most mature BD organization I've ever been a part of. We'd actually split the organization in terms of verticals and vertical focus. Um, again, when we were defining BD, I heard everything from channel sales to product. Um, and in my mind, that product piece is probably the, the most <coughs> essential bit of BD. Your BD people need to really understand the product, and they can only understand specific parts of a product so well when the product gets to grow in that way. So in particular, at Amex, we were you know, looking at you know, one side of the team was focusing on marketing tools and those types of partnerships, and the other one was focused on cash flow. So very different types of product. Um, and again, so the maturity of the business and, and the business needs. That's great. So where you, you touched on the team again, and a bunch of us have, but what is, what's the planning behind that? Are you, I mean, who's, who are your first hires? And what's kind of the goal in terms of the next, the strategy of growing that team and so forth? This, what, what's been your thinking on that? Our thinking at Cloudflare um, initially was let's hold off on scaling a sales team and focus first on uh, scaling a kind of a business development function, a partnerships function, uh, before we start hiring um, the sales team. And I think Mark on the earlier panel um, differentiated the different stages of building a sales team really nicely. So for the longest time, um, we did not have an enterprise sales team, but that's partly driven by the nature of our business, which was in the early days all self-serve. So it was a lot more important that we have the right support team to support those customers and that we have the right partners. Um, so my thoughts are if you are selling a highly technical solution um, and if there's a lot of partnerships and channel opportunities, don't rush hiring that first salesperson and especially not a VP of sales. And if you do hire a salesperson, hire that general athlete who is, is crappy and technical and excited about your product and your customer and is not as commission driven as a typical salesperson. How about others on that hiring plan and team? Michael? We've, when, at the beginning we started with, with sort of generalists um, kind of athletes who could be part-time sales people, part-time product people, part-time deal makers, part-time uh, product managers. And we found those people who could also, by the way, interface with pretty senior C-level folks in, in each market. Um, we've placed that person and then we've built teams around them. So over time, you start to have people that start to specialize like a deal maker or um, a partner manager or somebody who's more sort of a technical troubleshooter. Um, but the, the key hire for us has always been, you know, you got to get that right first leader, at least from a regional perspective, in each market or each part of the world, who you can 
feel confident can pretty much do everything and then grow a team around um, and, and be a real leader at the company. Um, we've been, um, Twitter I think everybody would, would, would admit has been a little bit too um, US focused, at least in the deep past, and putting business development people in other regions of the world that were real leaders and understood the market real well to proselytize back at headquarters, super important. Um, so I guess I would say for us in each market, it's been about finding that leader, finding that like athlete, and then finding somebody you have the confidence to build around and then, and then doing just that, that, building a team around that person. Um, I, I do agree with what's been said. I guess the only other thing to add is it's really hard to get an experienced BD leader that will fit startup culture and, and thrive. I've seen people who are really awesome on paper, they come from very successful backgrounds and then they hit the reality of the startup and it's like, holy crap. Um, and so my experience has been people who you know, are generalists, who have some product, who are pre presentable and wicked smart and, and just entrepreneurs. People, you know, like the founders that many of you guys are, um, if you can get clones that will be the future CEOs, that's who you want, even if they don't have much experience. I would index heavily towards that type of person, rather than somebody who, you know, did this amazing thing running a program at VMware or SAP or Oracle. Um, they don't necessarily translate or transfer it that well. What's the surprise, Neil? Is it the, the chaos, just the, the lack of control? I mean, what are the things that really kind of stun people? I think it's the um, lack of resources is probably one of the biggest things. Is like you want to go do, oh, we have this tension all the time, whereas we want to go do these amazing things. There's an unbelievable depth of opportunity, um, but you're always going on instinct and gut on what's the right thing to do right now. And so, but, that changes very quickly and you might go fast on something and then something else comes along that's better. You're not going to burn the resources and it's, it's constant. And I would say that that, uh, that speed is something that is hard to, you have to, but again, many people in this room understand what I'm talking about, but that's not something that always transfers from bigger companies. Even though those guys have got the deal-making exper expertise and maybe the technical expertise, but they don't necessarily have the DNA. Any thoughts? Yeah, it's just a little controversial. I would say don't hire BD. Just don't do it. <laughs> Wait until you absolutely have to. But like I think it's kind of been said, there, especially at early stage, uh, BD is going to be a distraction. You have uh, you know look, look, watching Sean and the slides and being that tactical about getting to a place where you've got product market fit. I didn't see BD as any as adding value in many of those places. So again, knowing that we're talking to an audience of uh, yeah entrepreneurs and, and early startups, right? So wait, then you, then there's a kind of a, find the hunters, there's that BD hunter mode, and then there's the BD farmer farming mode. Um, so the hunters are gonna go out there and kind of find the, the new thing and help close it and bring it in. Um, they can only do so many of those before you actually need to put someone in there who knows to how to kind of continue to extract value from those deals. So don't do it, then get a hunter, and then get a farmer. And the, if you can get a hunter and the farmer work really well together, um, you can build a lot of value. Yeah, I, I, maybe in certain businesses, and I appreciate um, being controversial, I love that. I am Irish. Um, it depends on the business, right? If you're building, I, I mean, I work at Oracle, and, and Larry Ellison built a business out of a shitty database, but he did deals with all of the operating systems and hardware companies, and there's a perception that it was you, you know, homogeneous across every platform and enterprises said, that's what I need, even though he hadn't actually done it. And so there is a time and a place, it depends on what you want to do. Um, one could argue that you know, uh, Aaron Libby, the founder of Box, um, has the ability to bring together a lot of different companies uh, to go do things and it creates um, momentum, which is important as a startup. So it really depends on what you're trying to accomplish. I appreciate it. I'd say how many Larry Ellisons are there, how many Aaron Libby's are there. I haven't, I haven't met a lot. There's 50 of them in this room. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Okay, uh, questions on, on uh, team and uh, scaling basics. Anyone? What? Okay. Uh, okay, sure. Yeah. Uh, so this 
question is for David. Um, what if the company's focus <laughs> of getting the first customers is from channel? Um, is that a bad thing? So is that finding the channel, or is that actually uh, selling into the channel? It's selling through the channel. So the founders come from a particular company. That company is very successful. And that company acts as the channel or a go-to-market, at least for the first 10 customers. So I'll go back to what these guys were saying on the previous panel, which is yep. the CEO has to be the first and best salesperson. This is my what I've seen. And then I kind of, uh, beyond that, about to what Maria said about how the first set of salespeople aren't necessarily commission driven. They're not going operated. As Sean said it, there are folk, folks who are thinking a little bit more scrappily about the product and how they, they're passionate about it and they're out there. And you evolve into that. So the question is, do, do you still, in that situation, do you need a BD person? Or wait? If you know what your channels are, I, I don't think so. But that's just, again, an early day. And I, and I, would, I was being controversial. I'd say early days, it's about that focus. Um, if you're already evolved into a channel, you know, psychology, and you know what those things are, and you need to expand them, and you know, get creative, but. Go ahead. Well, one thing I was gonna say about selling through channel, I, I depends on the product very much, but I do believe having a person, whether you call them partnerships person or channel person, or whatever you wanna call them, who understands your product and your technology, but also can go and understand the channel partner's needs and pain points, um, is very important um, way to build that relationship and scale it because oftentimes what I've seen is you close a very exciting deal, you put that logo on your website or on your materials, and and you make one or two sales. But getting getting to that 50% penetration through channel or, or scaling with a specific channel partners really requires relationship management and business development person. And in fact, the first hire I made on the, the business development team at Cloudflare was a product a product manager, very technical, to help me specifically work with the engineering team to build product for channel in particular. And again, depends on your, your solution. Okay. Any other questions? Oh, yeah. I was just going to ask one thing. So you mentioned the idea of a farmer BD versus a hunter BD. Uh, what's that profile look like and what are the differences to spot between those two if you're sort of screening people? It's a, it's a great question and it's one that uh, I've heard I'm struggling with right now. So uh, again, I, I look at where we are and I, even though we're established around the world, I think in the US we're, we're quite new. Um, and we're still trying to prove that new channels can work. So uh, at, at this point, we've got a few good new channels from hunting. We've gone out there. They're a little bit more aggressive, a little bit more creative in terms of meeting, the, meeting new people and finding the new opportunities. Um, and then the, the farmer has got that same kind of, I'm happy to be out there meeting new people, but I'd rather work off of an established relationship. And now that I'm within these four walls and these confines, I can actually figure out the value um, and, and fine tune it. So what do they look like? It's a little bit harder to define. I'd say the person who really loves to work a room is your hunter, and the person who walk into a room where they know everybody and you know have conversations all night is your farmer. Okay, great. Why don't we jump to the next topic quickly, which is business development as a career. So maybe could each of you say a little bit about what does that entail? I mean, what does it feel like to you? What's been the career path for you? What's been the lifestyle, etc.? I mean, tell us a little bit about your 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 week to week. I I got into business development um, by chance. I remember I was uh, I was I was managing. This is at Virgin. Um, I was managing our, our data products, and it turns out we had to actually go get some content to populate uh, you know a vending machine that we were trying to create as a part of the service. And I was the only one in the building to, to do it. Everybody else was doing something else. And so I remember calling up the lawyer and, and uh, this woman named Lisa, and she was like, uh, okay, well, you know, if we're gonna go work with um, EA, why don't you go put together a term sheet? And I was like, yeah, good idea. Like, what the hell is it? What's a term sheet look like? Um, and I just kind of started doing it. And um, 
and it was a lot of fun. And the, you know, the next job, and I went from Virgin, and I, I was in marketing the whole time. But then I just became business development, and I went to Google, and um, that was that was sort of it. Um, I think uh, since then it's just been um, it's it's really being out with the community. Um, it's it's listening to people talk. And Maria mentioned something earlier. It's uh, uh, the the real the, the real art is understanding what uh, your partner's business is all about and then trying to connect back in, at headquarters with what you're trying to do and, and find the overlap um, and most of that is listening less of that is talking I, f I found um, and that's uh, listening whether it's um, you know whether it's in your office or it's on a street or it's in a place like this or it's in Tokyo or it's wherever but it tends to be wherever the wherever the partner is so um, you know, another thing that I've loved about it is just that it's really, um, it is really different um, and it changes over time. So, so we've been talking about um, sometimes being a partner, a uh, product manager, sometimes being a deal maker, sometimes being a farmer, sometimes being a hunter. It's really, it's really just kind of going with the flow and being flexible about, about the value that you're, you're bringing to the business. Um, uh, that's been my experience. Um, so for my journey has been started out more on the product side and then marketing and I liked financial business modeling so I did pricing and, and somebody said you'd be good at this and so I kind of fell into it it was not a career and then I spent the last 10 years trying to get out of it um, not because I don't love it but because after seven years at a large company that makes Symantec um, I decided to run a business um, that we bought and incubated something, and then I, you know, was, uh, joined Box, and I was like, well, you, you obviously you're great at business development, so can you do this? So, and so I'm, now I'm actually taking on some business incubation in addition to that. Um, so I, I actually enjoy it. It's uh, challenging because there's more opportunity than there is time of the day to do things. Um, so it's you're always thinking like a GM in my mind. Um, so it's one of the but I always tell people who are, especially uh, younger people who are in my team or in, anybody wants any advice on this, it's like, it, it's not necessarily a career uh, long, long term. It could be, and it can be, and it can be fulfilling. It's also a great stepping stone to uh, senior leadership. You're doing senior deal making, um, understanding you know, your way around a P&L, understanding a domain and technology, negotiating, evangelizing. These are all important skills that if you're a engineer, you may not get. If you're a salesperson, you may get, but in very limited scope. So it's a really awesome stepping stone if people want to go do other things beyond that. So I'll echo what everybody just said again. It's a general management position, um, and you learn a lot, and you're doing everything. And this is where I'm going to separate myself from the panelists. I don't want to offend anybody. I do, I do BD because I'm an entrepreneur who, who lacks the balls to go do something entirely on my own. So instead, I sit in somebody else's house and, and start businesses. So if you're already out there doing it, you know, I don't know that it's a good fit for you. Because, but that's, uh, that's my thinking. <laughs> I, I, that, that's brave, that's, that's great. I, I mean, I, it's, it's really, I mean, it, it's really true. As a business development person, you're part GM, you're part sales, you're part strategy, oftentimes you're corporate development, you do a lot. So my personal path uh, into, I stumbled into business development for a startup. So um, I had the fortune of uh, learning deal making at Boeing from one of the top Boeing salespeople. Um, and, and I spent five years there um, where you know, the deal cycles, it takes two to three years to close a major deal. Most of them were international. I was, uh, well, what was my title? Um, licensing manager as part of the intellectual property team or something like that. Uh, but I was learning from the best, and, and that made me really passionate about deal making and really understanding all parties and all stakeholders in a situation that allows you to close a deal. So I went from selling fighter jets into a um, completely different line of business. So I did spend some time in venture capital and had a very interesting fork in the road deciding do I want to really pursue a career in VC or do I want to go and get operating experience which you know is a buzzword especially in the in the valley 
So I decided that they really want to get operating experience. And at Cloudflare, my first day, I showed up and I said, what do you want me to do? You know, I, I was early business hire. Um, so I've done everything from customer service to sales to API integrations. And mind you, I'm not an engineer by background. So oftentimes, people would come and ask me, um, how do I get a job, like a business development job at a startup? It means like, don't, don't even say the word business development, just show up and do whatever helps them the most and know exactly what you're bringing to the table. But so my path was a little bit more long-winded, which is we kind of build this partnerships function and channel, and now we've turned it into more of a business development discipline function. Um, and you know, I, I'm not a career business development person. Who knows where I'm going to be next time? But it's a lot of fun, and I'm learning a lot. So, what what are the skills then that you think each of your selves has that really is enabling you to do this so well? I mean, you're all great speakers, but what what do you think is the talent that people should be have, make sure that they have in order to do this job? And maybe is it the same thing that you're looking for in people that you're that you're trying to hire as well? I'd say being an incredible listener when you are identifying opportunities and are in externally facing meetings, um, being able to bring people together inside your company to get things done. You spend a lot of time talking about how many engineers it takes to support one business development person. It's very much true at most technology companies. Um, another thing is just being um, scrappy and versatile as an individual and understanding the bigger picture, being able to relate it um, both at the technical level and the sales level and just across the company is very important. That's helped me a lot. Yeah, two, two really good ones. One, um, like Maria said, uh, being a champion for, for the partner in your cause, which is a little bit cheerleader, a little bit quarterback, um, back at the home base. So really just kind of knowing your, your partner's business and making sure you can advocate for it um, with internally, huge, uh, huge um, important characteristic. And then the other one also uh, piggybacking on what Maria just said is, um, is this idea of just empathy, being able to listen before you talk. I mean, the worst, the worst I think in business development is somebody who gets in and uh, into a meeting and shows a big presentation and doesn't really listen to what the partner wants because that's really what it's all about. You're not going to get a deal done unless you know what your partner wants and you can help them achieve it um, while getting what you want at the same time. So I would say those two things pretty much overlapping exactly with what Maria just said. Uh, yeah, to just add, um, being a bulldozer is a good thing. So tough skinned, you're always going to get no from somebody. Um, usually in BD, when you're doing big deals, you cut across the whole company on both sides. And that's, if you're selling something, you can, you can either get yes or no from somebody who's buying. That's actually not that hard. If you're trying to structure a deal, if you're an engineer, you're, you can build something that will work or it won't. And if you have more time, you maybe you'll get there. If you're doing a deal that some people want to do and others don't in both organizations, and those com the decision making goes across every function in both companies, it's really hard to get a, a good deal done that actually works. Um, so that's something that I look for is somebody who's just like, just has grit and an ag aggressive, smart, and is you know it's not going to take no for an answer. Sometimes you turn, you feel like you have to turn them off as like yeah well, I got it but. They're the type of people that are usually good. Yeah, I agree with what everybody said. I like grit. That's <laughs> funny. I actually did. I just uh, someone just hired someone uh, as a BD manager, and she has no BD experience, uh, no industry experience at all. Um, she actually was uh, doing uh, coffee, fair trade coffee work in Ethiopia. Uh, but she walked in, and so again, zero is online accounting for small business. So we're solving problems in the back office trying to optimize workflows and data management. And I said, you know, I looked at her resume and had a good conversation with her. I said, so why do you want this job? Um, why do you want to do business development? She said, well, I am really passionate about information management and I love small business. And in my mind, that's what we're solving for. It's a pretty unsexy problem, but she's passionate about this problem and she wants to understand it. So she can automatically walk out into the marketplace and talk to someone who has a tool she's never heard of get the download on what that tool is, and all of a sudden connect the dots and see how it helps solve the problem that we're trying to solve. So in my mind, that's the, that's the core skill, is identifying 
the value that's out there and how we solve that problem and bringing it back to us. So um, before we bring Sean back, you know, I thought Sean's point about in the sales world of uh, making sure that you get true dollars from, you know, from the big customers uh, was interesting. Does that apply in, in your world as well, the BD world? I mean, are you guys, when, when you're signing up, you know, big, big logos, you know, how much value do you need to be getting in exchange or is it important just to get a deal done? What do you think? Nobody's going to say just get a deal done, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. Depending on the stage, right? <laughs> well, I, guess, I would say actively avoid some of the big deals, right? And they're big distractions. Um, I, I like the smaller deals. You can actually, again, it comes back to value for me. Can you extract value from that deal? And more often than not, the big deals are just going to extract value from you. So if I, and the, you know, you'll blow cycles, you'll blow years, all your funding, um, and there are no silver bullets. So, right? Product market fit. I didn't hear big, big partners on any of those slides that help you get to a five on any of those evaluation metrics. So it depends on what you're solving for. <laughs> There's times when you want to do a big deal for momentum that may or may not result in immediate revenue, but that gives you the option to have that negotiation down the road with another company that will. Um, and there's times to be hard asked about what's in it for me. And it really depends. And there is, I mean, I could go on, uh, we have this debate actively all the time. Um, there is a argument to be said that you, you want to do both and you want to do it all the time because that's sucking oxygen out of the ecosystem of other companies that you're competing with, so long as you can sustain the resource burn that's required. So can I ca I'll caveat? So I would say <laughs> if, if a big deal is not going to make you do an unnatural act for what your business model is, yeah, then yes, right? That's a good thing to pursue. But if you have to change who you are to, to comply and actually get the value back, then that would be that would be my caveat. So. <laughs> good caveat. Okay. I mean, I, I guess. Um, yeah, the, the way I've looked at it always, if there's not a, a path to driving some sort of KPI that you care about, and it's really just, you know, signing a deal and doing a press release, um, I don't know, it's probably not worth worth doing. Um, I think people can generally see through a partnership that's empty and that's just kind of sitting on the shelf, like a contract that's just sitting on the shelf. Um, if it's something that takes a while to pay off, that's I think that's okay. You just have to get your arms around how long it's going to take and what the eventual outcome or expected value of the thing will be. Um, but yeah, I think people can see through the, the logo on the screen, you know, pretty easily. And and it typically is, if it's if it's a logo that matters, then it's going to be a pain in the butt to get that deal done in the first place. And you're going to be wondering, well, you know, why you did it if it's just sitting on the shelf. I, I think everything was really well said. Um, my philosophy is when we are going after big deals, I want to make sure that we're ready and that that partner is going to have a great experience. If it is a sales logo, that's a whole different story. That, then, you know, if it's a combination of a deal where business development helps the sales team, then we do everything possible to, to close the deal and partner very closely with our sales team. It really depends on the deal. But from a partnership standpoint, I tend to not go after logos um, because in the long run it doesn't pay off. What pays off is a really well thought out and well structured partnership that moves the needle. That's great, great thoughts. Is, um, can Sean and the others return and then let's go ahead and open it up for questions for, for the whole group then. So questions, yes, in the back. So um, I want to thank you guys for mentioning, uh, I love your comment about saying how you're cut on both sides because I think that's part that being, in a, especially being in a startup doing ED, um, you're always cut and I think startups tend to, even to the founders sometimes will forget that, you know, you're trying to push the, uh, the pendulum for your organization to kind of go further. But I have a question about for all of your organizations, uh, for all of your companies that you work for and represent, how receptive are you to small startup, or startups like ourselves who want to try to foster these partnerships? Because I know you guys did say a lot about it, but how open are do you guys have an infrastructure to really help if we're doing SaaS or if we're doing we deal with the and, so the question is, how receptive are you to the little companies out there, the startups? I'll, I'll take this very receptive because we expect you guys to to grow and, and be you know meaningful. So if if I can start working with you when you're just building your infrastructure or, or 
product and if I can help you um, think through it with our solution in mind, that's really, really powerful um, as you grow your company. And the other thing is uh, Cloudflare has a startup uh, program as well where we give a certain service similar to what AWS will do or Rackspace will do. So if that's of interest, happy to talk. Questions, yeah, right here. Um, yeah, mine's directed Sean and his group, I guess. So we're a subscription-based business, but we're our customers are consumers, not businesses. So my question is your your five points there. Which of those survive as, as what counts factors for a consumer directed subscription business and what what other factors would you add or take away? Yeah. It's a good question. Well, you know, I have spent zero time in consumer in my career. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny, you know, Dreamforce is a SaaS conference, and I got this question at Dreamforce too. Um, I, I guess the, the most important thing is how important is this product to the consumer? You know, so I would think, you know, engagement. You know, there's a, you know, all of us are consumers in, of a lot of products, and you'll test out a lot of things. So the number of times someone downloads a product or clicks on a link, it doesn't mean anything. People are curious. At what point does it become a product that they want to use on an ongoing basis to solve whatever consumer pain point they have? You know, I think that that, you know, and, and so that probably translates in a bunch of those areas. You know, I guess the other thing is, um, it's not a business tool, you get money. So, you know, how are you gonna actually monetize? And sometimes people trick people into paying or find other revenue sources. So, um, that also would carry over as well. Yeah, I mean, our, our application uh, at Intuitive is really interesting in that we do sell the product to businesses. It's basically a portal where they invite their happy customers in to go and do stuff uh, for them. But 99% of our users do not work for the companies who pay our bills. They are free agents. So we have a whole side of our business that studies the consumer, um, uh, the consumer part of it. And so we have a whole bunch of metrics around that. Um, and so we have metrics around, for example, frequency. So how often do they come to the site? How many challenges they do? Uh, how many challenges do they do per session? How many sessions do they do per month? Uh, the value of, of those activities. So for example, a referral lead is worth a lot more than a retweet, right? So that's kind of like, you probably heard of RFM, recency, frequency, monetary value. So we have some similar concepts around that. Um, there's also retention curves that you can do. So just as businesses have churn, so do consumers, right? So um, we use like a, it's like a half-life concept, you know, like a radioactive isotope, so they, they decay in a logarithmic curve. So we look at that religiously and we're constantly trying to improve those curves, and get it hot, you know, figure out how to retain better and better and better. So that might be some of the metrics that you could look at there. Yeah, this is a BD question. So uh, Maria, you brought up the point about with working with logos that are large, wanting to have a great partnership experience. So say you're having those conversations and they're interested, but you're just, frankly, you feel like you're not able to actually execute on that great partner experience. So how would you kind of keep those conversations going and not drop the momentum? Is there like a MVP use case? Say you could pair your products together without a technical integration. Like how do you show the interest, but you want to do it right, but not show like you want to ignore them for a while and come back to the table later? So I have actually two things that may help you on, on this question. So with our um, enterprise level services, for the longest time, we didn't feel ready and scaled enough to offer um, plan uh, to offer a service, let's say, to Fortune 50 companies. So, but we did have the interest, incoming interest, both from partners and from enterprises. So we created something called Enterprise Advisory Board. Um, where we pretty much said, look, we're actively working on it, we're still evaluating the opportunity, join our board, give us your feedback. And that's how we stayed engaged. Uh, and it took us a very long time to actually launch a full-scale enterprise offering. So it's saying, number one, if you can find what's interesting to them, do they want to help you shape your solution, and then be very transparent with them, because oftentimes, you get that partner, they'll get, or, or customer, they'll get bad experience. It is very difficult to get them to refocus because they may have moved on with someone else. Um, and the second, um, the second thing around um, big logos was, um, what do I want to say, around 
kind of thinking through when is the right time to, to, to engage with them, um, constantly like going to them maybe, doing trainings with them or they do trainings for your team, just find those touch points um, to keep the conversation going, go to their events if they have events and conferences, make sure you know who is who, send them relevant blog posts, press releases, whatever you're doing, just keep that communication going until you're ready and once you're ready, um, go for it. Everyone on the BE panel, because the answer will be different. What are your success metrics and why? Uh, I, I can go uh, ARR. That's obvious. Um, we have a notion of influenced ARR, which is not directly from a partner, but it's influenced by the fact that you did an integration. But we measure that based upon seven day active of an integration. So GE buys Box and Salesforce. We've inter the reason why one of them may be because it's integrated. We measure the seven day active of those users for that integration over some baseline of you know, a similar type of customer not using an integration and you can see what the churn is over time. We spend a lot of time thinking about metrics. It is important. Depends. <laughs> so I, obviously, so for for again for zero, the way that I look at it, we have we have buckets of partnership opportunity. We have large financial institutions we're trying to partner with. We have small companies who are building to our API. Um, we have large outbound integrations that we do. Folks like Square. Um, yeah, I, I would say that it's it's for sure not the number of deals we sign. That's the worst metric. It is. Um, I agree with that. <laughs> it's gonna it's gonna be case dependent. So for banks, it literally is the number of integrations we launch, not how many we bring on. Um, and then again, down the road, those metrics will change, and how many people are actually using those integrations. Um, so there is, I don't believe there are short term BD goals. I think they are all long term. So again, that's why it really depends. Consumer business, where business development deals are really just focused on bringing new users to the top of the funnel, so getting them exposed to Twitter content, whether it's syndicated on ESPN or in a newspaper or on front page Yahoo, or somebody that actually comes into um, somehow drawing them into the Twitter owned and operated app, right? So it's about bringing new users into the funnel and then getting them signed in. We tend to think about um, churn and engagement over time is more of a product issue. Not that we're not all working closely together, but our real focus is bringing people to the top of the funnel. Just something to add, um, we have different categories of partners. So let's say, for example, in the hosting provider category, I look at the overall ecosystem, there are about 45,000 hosting providers in the world, and we partner with 12% of them. We directly integrate it into their control panels, so that's over 5,000 of those partners. So I, I look very closely at that and then look at the, the size of those partners and measure my team against like what conversations are we having, um, what, what's going on with the partners that we consider strategic. And then of course from a channel and distribution standpoint, uh, looking at a new customer that's uh, customers who signed up through channel, um, which reseller plan they attached to, why they did or didn't, um, those are kind of more measurable things. But typically, if your business development function is strategy driven, that may not be the right measurement in the beginning. And you have to be very careful um, to, to, to not focus your team on driving things like that um, when they should be instead focusing on understanding an ecosystem and penetrating a market and that takes a long time. So just know your business and figure out what's the right metrics for you. Okay, uh, one last question, yeah. Uh, in Related to that question, what would be the right uh, compensation plan for a person, given those metrics? A lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> Define a lot. <laughs> I, I won't try again. I really think it depends on where that person came from and what's 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 motivating them. I, I, I'll keep coming back to the, the best BD people are in all, many circumstances are product people. Um, so they're going to be really oriented around that product and consider them a product manager for all intents and purposes. So whatever the salary scale there. Yeah, um, I'm more a fan of aligning to the executive comp plan, not sales complex. 
because typically it is um, about moving the needle for, for value, all the things we talked about, but it's, if you're just getting an incremental uh, you know, return on that FTE, they should be in sales. If you're getting disproportionate kicker in valuation of the company strategically over time, they're more like contributing at the exec level, and you should have similar, not obviously the same amount of money as the CEO, but uh, structurally the same way. If for, for junior business development people, Glassdoor would be a good resource to get a sense of per region what the average salary expectations are. There are also a number of blog posts on the topic and Quora posts, like uh, talking about percentage of equity depending on what series of funding you've raised at the company. Depends on whether you have appetite for an SVP type of level person or a junior person who will grow into it or move on to something else. So just, just know your numbers and how far you can go. So I just, I know I'm not on the BD panel, but I am a CEO who's hired a few BD people. Um, it depends on the level, so um, the way that my head of BD is compensated, um, half of the bonus is um, an executive bonus, as you said. His bonus is the same as my bonus as CEO. Not, not in terms of overall level, but in composition. So we are motivated the same way. He also has, you know, equity chunk, just like just like I do. But he does have objectives. So the other half, though, is in terms of objectives that a lot of, in my case, are really top of the funnel oriented. So a lot of my BD right now is oriented around ISVs. So getting complementary partners to integrate with my product and frankly generate lots of low cost leads for my sales team. Um, and uh, you know later on, we might do some channel partner types of things. And then there'll be other metrics around that. So I've actually have a junior BD person that's just started and she's really focused on service partners. So she's got different objectives um, there, so you're right. I think that's the hard about BD is it means so many different things. Is it channel partners? Is it ISV kind of stuff? Is it is it monster OEM multi million dollar deals? Like it really depends on the situation. Okay, well great. Let's thank the panelists.